All right, here we go, guys. Welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. We're gonna do Q&A today, per usual. First, let me just go over a couple interesting things going on in the shop. Let me update you a little bit. Uh, this is very exciting. Right next to me is a box. And in this box is guitar number 106, which I am shipping out to California. You know, there's a moment when you get the instrument that you've been working on into the box and you actually close that box up and put a little packaging tape on it and it's just a splendid moment <laughs> because at that exact moment suddenly there's nothing I can do reasonably to damage this guitar and up until that point I, I always feel this tremendous stress when I get to the end of a build because it's so incredibly easy when you're just buffing out the guitar or putting on the pick guard or all these these little moments where you could just drive a thumbnail right into the top accidentally which I've done and will continue to do on almost every guitar I produce this guitar however actually has no thumbnail or fingernail indentations in the top which is rare for me I'm pretty proud of that so yeah um, I always feel really good once I Get it into the box. Close the box up. Okay, there's nothing I can do to damage this guitar at this point. That feels really good. Of course, I'm now handing it off to people who don't really give a shit about this guitar. That would be the people handling it through shipping. Uh, we'll see what, what, what they do. But, honestly, I did a really good job, as I will always do, packing up this box. Actually, my wife has kind of put her in charge of among many things, dealing with shipping and kind of figuring out how to pack things appropriately. The best thing really is to have that box packed tight and even more importantly to have the dead spaces within the case packed extra tight and to use a really good solid case. We're using a fiberglass case here for David. And honestly, aside from not accidentally nicking the finish or the, or the wood with my thumbnail and causing damage, I am especially proud of my work on this guitar. I think it honestly represents, in a very fundamental sense, my best effort, what I'm capable of. I say in a very fundamental sense, because I didn't do anything wacky with this guitar, except the fact that my uh, headstocks are always a little bit wacky to m most people. <laughs> if you expect an orthodox looking headstock, uh, you you don't usually get that from me. For what I deliver, it's a really standard guitar, but this, as far as the fundamentals, this guitar just hit all the marks for me. And as far as the, the tonal response from it, I'm very proud of honestly how everything turned out. It really is just my best work to date. As a builder, that's generally true as you build new guitars anyway. Every guitar should be better than the last one if you're doing it right. You know, it's possible to decline if you, you know, start to uh, speed things up and try and make your process too efficient or something like that. Your, your quality will suffer. You see that happen with big manufacturers all the time. But it's not a common thing with independent builders such as myself. Typically, we don't fall into that trap and our work just just gets more refined from one build to the next. Anyway, that is definitely the case with this guitar. Genuinely sad to see it go, but with it leaving the shop, I know there's also the feedback that I get from it actually getting into the hands of the musician who paid for it and I get to get their feedback and uh, basically hear, hear what they think of it. So that's very valuable to me. Very, very valuable. So David, if you're listening to this, give me a call. And uh, once you get this guitar, uh, let's, let's have a chat. And uh, I know I already uh, emailed you th that message. So, uh, but hey, if you're watching this, we're going to talk. Anyway, I am sad to see this go, which brings me to the point too, that I'm also going to be updating the website now with the next two build slots, so if you enjoyed watching this guitar get made, um, the way that this works is I post my build slots on my website, usually 
I'll do two build slots in the winter and then two build slots in the summer. So very few opportunities there. And you put down a deposit and you get one of those build slots. So what happens then is I will get in contact with you and we will have a dialogue and determine exactly what you want in a guitar. And I am truly always interested in hearing your ideas of, of what you require as a musician and we'll see what we can come up with, okay? I actually, I like when I get a challenge, essentially. And I'll be filming the process and uh, posting it on YouTube and all of that for the entertainment and education of you all. So yeah, if you enjoyed watching that Guitar 106, your guitar could be the next one. Go to ericshaferguitars.com, two spots for the winter. For the winter, it'll, it clearly states there on the website when the build will start and when you can expect to have your guitar delivered to you. So the whole process is pretty laid out and cut and dry if you check it out on the website. EricSchaferGuitars.com, I'll put a link down in the description. Okay, with that, let's you know push this box to the side and I'm gonna grab my phone and we are going to answer your questions. Let's see what we got. All right, so first let's start with the question of the week. And once again, for the second time, second week in a row here, nobody in the members forum, the private members forum, answered the question of the week. Wah, wah, wah. That's always a bummer. It bums me out. So please, guys, <laughs> answer my questions. Uh, that's okay, though. I'm, I'm going to give you guys my answer anyway. And you guys on YouTube, this gives you an opportunity to provide your responses to this, which maybe I'll, I'll read in the next one. So that'd be great. It's a good question too. This was a really good one. The question of the week is, what is the worst injury or close call you have had in the shop and what did you learn from it? Now I thought about this for a little bit and I couldn't think of uh, anything really crazy except for one thing that happened recently, which was, let me see if I can explain this. It was a, on the table saw. It was really a, an issue that had never come up before that uh, I hadn't really thought about. I, I had been trimming boards down to thickness and when I was trimming down those boards these little thin sheets on the waist side of the board were falling off and some of them were slipping down into the chassis of the the table saw you know down that little slit between the actual table and the the saw blade you know that happens and they shoot out the back typically but these were kind of larger sheets and after I had made all those cuts I then had some other boards that I needed to that were much lower in height that I needed to just rip down the middle and so I quickly you know turned off the machine I lowered the blade down and got my new boards ready and turned on the machine now what had happened was what I didn't realize is that there were some of those waist pieces from the last cuts, those sheets were down in the chassis. And now that I lowered the blade, the blade was sitting right on top of those pieces of wood. And the second I turned it on, I mean, it was just, I got peppered. It was just like I got shot in the face with a shotgun. <laughs> I mean, not really, that would kill me, but uh, it was, it felt like that uh, because I just got peppered with these tiny little splinters of, of mahogany. Anyway, that could, could have been worse. I was wearing my eye protection. I always wear eye protection, especially for something like that. I never, uh, I never mess with that because I know it just takes one time to really, really injure yourself. And so I was very thankful that I was wearing my eye protection in this moment. But even with the eye protection, you know, eye protection most eye protection and a lot of the eye protection that I have doesn't wrap around my eyes completely. So there's always a way that something can get under there. Not to mention my cheeks and my forehead got pretty, pretty well peppered by those splinters of wood. So these machines are powerful and you might think that the saw blade just throwing some scrap wood at you isn't going to hurt too bad, but honestly, you can, you can do some serious damage. You can, draw blood by just something as stupid as what I did there. 
So anyway, I hope you learned a little something from that. So the thing to be learned there is that uh, don't just let those little pieces fall underneath the saw and collect down there because when you lower the blade, they're all gonna be coming right back up at you and at your face. So there we go. That's my uh, mistake. My bad. Uh, let's check out your questions now. I'm sure you got plenty of them in here because I haven't done a Q&A in a little bit, so I know there's questions that have been building up. All right, LC Guitars says, I love roasted flamed maple. Here's an electric neck I'm working on getting some oil finish before fretting. Oh, that looks really nice. Very, very nice. Yeah, I've never done a maple fretboard before. So I do like the look of them. And his looks really sweet there. He's got some ebony uh, binding, fretboard binding. Or I guess you, you would call that the purfling. Ebony purfling with some uh, lighter colored binding on the outside. And then some ebony dots there. That's something different rather than standard mother of pearl. All right. Nice work there. Let's see what else we got. Patrick writes, has anyone tried spraying true oil? Getting it applied evenly by hand is the tricky part. I'm wondering if I cut the true oil to 90% mineral spirits and about 10% oil and spray it, maybe I could skip the rubbing it out step. I'm guessing it won't work, but I'm curious if anyone here has tried it. If you're talking about spraying on a finished, a completed guitar with the bridge attached and the neck attached, absolutely uh, don't even try it. Spraying is really intended for guitars that are not, not completely built, that are not attached, okay? When you have these inside corners between the heel and the body and inside corners between the bridge and the body, there's no way to spray that without getting a lot of accumulation in those inside corners, and then there's no way to sort of even that out. Finishing in general is all about the application and nailing the application. It's not about slopping on finish and then, you know, leveling or buffing out at mistakes after the fact. I, th I could be wrong about this. I think there was, let me look this up. I think there was some spray true oil product. So I think technically you can do that. Just probably not in the way that you're asking, Patrick. Unless, I mean, maybe you are, in your case, finishing with the bridge removed and the neck and body detached. So let's look this up. So I was looking for the product, but I did find this uh, forum thread here where uh, the person's right. Spraying true oil, so far so good. One part lacquer thinner to two parts oil. Mixed up two ounces at a time and sprayed in a preval disposable sprayer. True oil is best used quickly. It dries very fast. About four coats on as of this morning. Should be good and dry when I get home from work this evening. The body is black limba over mahogany. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, he writes at the end, I may be seeking help with the wet sanding slash buffing process. And honestly, if you're relying on wet sanding, kind of like I was just mentioning, if you're relying on wet sanding and buffing to clean things up, then your process is just wrong. You need to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way to apply it evenly, uh, again, rather than trying to fix everything after the fact. So it's, it's definitely not the faster way if you're trying to save effort and time by spraying it, assuming that you're gonna put all of that work or more time and effort into cleaning up the sloppiness of uh, spraying into those corners. So anyway, this is a, uh, he's talking about doing this on like an, an electric guitar body anyway. So that's a little bit different. Uh, but I'm still trying to, f I'm just trying to figure out if this product exists because I think I've seen it. Okay, so I think everyone that is spraying true oil is doing it with um, a spray, with a spray gun. And they're mixing it themselves. I just thought I had seen a an aerosol can product oh and i think this is what i saw synthetic gun oil from birchwood casey which is the company that makes true oil it lubricates cleans and protects yeah that's this is not true oil something different anyway 
I don't want to be a negative Nancy and say don't do it, but I wouldn't do it. I'm gonna put it. I'm just gonna put it like that. I, I feel like you're trying to avoid a great deal of effort, which true oil finishing just is a great deal of effort. And I feel like you're, you're just gonna end up right back at the same place when you realize that spraying doesn't solve the problem. Patrick also asks how much to cut true oil. I've seen anywhere from 25% to 50% mineral spirits. Are there any advantages or disadvantages to cutting the true oil more or less? So yeah, the more you cut it with mineral spirits, the thinner it is, obviously. So your coat, if you thin it too much, your coat is practically non-existent. And by coat, I mean application, because technically coat isn't the right word. Your application is virtually non-existent if you cut it by more than, I would say more than 50%. If you do, I, I actually tried it once before doing like 75% and you'd have to do like 200 coats to, you know, actually get a finish on there. But the idea is this, and you can play with this. The idea is if you are not getting a perfectly level finish, including up in those corners that we talked about, then I would say you are getting feedback that is telling you to thin it out more. If you're getting a perfectly level finish and it just seems like it's not really building, then you are getting feedback that is saying, hey, I, I don't have any problems with accumulation in the corner or runs or, or goops of finish anywhere. So maybe I can thin it a little bit less so that it will actually build more and I won't have to do 200 coats. So that's really it. There's nothing bad that happens from thinning it too much. It's just that nothing happens. <laughs> you don't actually get a build in any reasonable amount of time. All right, and now let's give you guys on YouTube a chance to speak as well. We're going to check out the YouTube comments. Jonah Guitar Guy writes, When I was still building cabinets and furniture, I had a wood reclaiming company that I was building custom tables for. They supplied the wood, reclaimed teak from Thai pole houses, old fir mill beams, and various Asian hardwoods that I didn't know the names of. They just used a blanket name for all of it, Asian rosewood. One of those woods was so hard that it flattened the blades in my jointer in one pass. Wow, that's incredible. Throwing sparks, wow, that is a really hard wood. It looked as it as if it might have had minerals grown into it. I agree. Well, I'll read that last part in a second. I first just want to address that. Yeah, it is incredible. Isn't it truly incredible how some woods almost border on like being like rocks? Like, like we're working with a, a different material than wood entirely. Um, and you really learn that when you get into guitar making, especially if you came from a different woodworking discipline because so many of them deal in softwoods and if not softwoods, then just less hard hardwoods like cherry. So you get into guitar making and suddenly rosewood and ebony enter the picture and then if you're really unfortunate, you run into some of the stuff that this guy's talking about, which I have never had anything throw sparks. I mean, that's, you know, you can have mineral deposits in, in wood, so it must be something like that. That's incredible. Wow. And then he also writes, I agree with finishing being the biggest hurdle. It really is a completely different skill set. Yes. So he was responding to a previous Q&A where I talked about how finishing, um, well, really how everyone seems to agree that finishing is the, uh, gives us all the most trouble. You know, I don't, I don't think anybody within this world doesn't struggle with finishing. Maybe Jeff Jewett. Maybe he doesn't struggle with finishing. <laughs> Eric, why did you rename the channel? Um, you know, that's a good question. So the show has always been called DIY Guitar Making. And uh, my YouTube channel used to be called Eric Schaefer Guitars. And at one point, uh, just because I realized that if I Google DIY guitar making, I don't come up. I changed the name of my YouTube channel. I'm not sure what that affects. In fact, I wonder if, when I saw you ask this question, I wonder if maybe it changed how you 
would find me. So maybe uh, you had thought that I'd stopped making videos and then you suddenly realized that a different name. I don't know, but I'd love to, if you could let me know the answer to that question, that would be very interesting to me. Because uh, maybe I shouldn't have changed, changed the name, should have kept it at Eric Schaefer Guitars. But they're both true to me, because my business is Eric Schaefer Guitars. That's the guitars that I produce, that's the name under which I do it. Um, but the show itself, I call DIY guitar making. For no other reason than it just sounded like a fun idea for me. <laughs> okay, Short writes, oh, this is Keith Short. Hello, Keith. He writes, regarding Finnish, I recall someone saying, I think it was at the Kamaka Ukulele Factory in Honolulu, that when the instrument is ready for finish, you are about half done. That has certainly been my experience, but patient application of any finish produces a beautiful result. Uh, I'm not gonna stop there just to address that. Yeah, that's interesting that they would say that. I'd never thought of it that way before, but honestly, if I think about it, for me, when I get to the point when I'm finishing it, now I do things different than other people do, so it might be true for some, but for me, I would say I'm probably two thirds of the way done when I'm applying the finish. And part of that is just because even after the finish, there's some things I have to do, just some little, you know, action adjustments and adding a pick guard, if I'm putting an end pin strap on there or something. There's all these little things I have to do, boxing it up, right? That's a thing. And then, you know, the finish itself just takes such a god awful amount of time. <laughs> At least the way I do it. I, uh, I definitely go for the patient application that he's talking about. Very, very patient. Anyway, I agree with that and I find it interesting to hear a major manufacturer saying that, that they're about halfway done. Especially for them, because they do things so differently than we do. Uh, Keith goes on to write, I discovered in my tiny basement shop the importance of dust control during finishing. I installed an air purifier, same jet model you have. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he's got that back there. Same model you have, as well as a particulate sensor. That's a good idea. I now have many fewer dust nibs to deal with and things go more smoothly. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. Part I like the particulate sensor. I've thought about getting that. I remember hearing the wood whisperer. Uh, what's his name? Spagnola, Mark Spagnola, something like that. Uh, you guys, you guys probably know who he is. I remember hearing him talk about a particulate sensor, not for the purpose of finishing, but for your the, your own lungs and peace of mind. I think having one of those is a really good way of troubleshooting your dust collection slash exhaust slash air filtration system, right? Because it's always between those three things. You're collecting dust, you're filtering it, and in some cases you may have some system or way of exhausting it out of the building. And uh, whatever gets you to a good reading off of a particulate sensor, that's gonna be the thing that tells you that what you're doing is working and is making you safe, and that's always good. But I don't have one of those, and I should, and maybe I will, maybe I'll get one. BMWHP2 writes, question, I normally make the sides of my classical nylon string guitars around 90 millimeters, that's 3.6 inches. The current build, a chocolate dark brown Brazilian rosewood back, ooh, and kingwood sides, that's Dalbergia sierensis. On that, I made a mistake and the sides came out as 80 millimeters, that's 3.1 inches. Do you think it is lost, or should I try to build the guitar with less height, just having it higher in tone? I don't have any Dalbergia sides anymore that will complement the back. Thanks. This is a judgment call, but I would absolutely have no problem continuing the build, especially because you're dealing with such high value wood there, uh, especially the Brazilian rosewood back, although you did say your sides were not Brazilian rosewood. They're kingwood. Kingwood However, as far as I know, is a very expensive wood as well, although not nearly as expensive as Brazilian because, let's face it, nothing is that expensive. But regardless, I would, so it's not a big deal to change your depth unless you are absolutely married to getting a very specific tonal result. So functionally, if you continue to build this guitar with less depth, it's not gonna change anything about the function of your guitar 
or the way that you execute the build. Okay, so it's not gonna cause any problems. It's just in the end, you're going to end up with something that is characteristically different from what you were shooting for. And it could be different in a way that you like. Okay, in fact, there's a very good chance that you're going to like the result more this way. And I'd say an equally good chance that you won't like it. Because again, it's just different. It's not gonna be better necessarily. That's, that's my opinion on the whole depth thing. It's gonna, uh, as he mentioned, it's gonna make it sound brighter, which you might like, and it's going to, I think it's going to make it project more, which you might like, because the back is now closer to the top. Okay, that's how, how you get more of that projection. All right, so yeah, I, I would go for it. Especially because you said you didn't, you don't have any more Dalbergia sides, and if you use something that's not a Dalbergia there, it's probably not going to look. It's just probably not going to match up with the way the back looks, and it's going to look awkward. And you don't want to do that to your nice Brazilian back. You don't want to sort of devalue it by putting um, mahogany sides on there, or something that just obviously jumps out as a different wood, visually speaking. Okay, he also writes a different question here. Thanks for the good videos and help. For finishing, I tried nitrocellulose, acrylic, and French polishing. I haven't found an easy way to finish my classical guitars. Yeah, <laughs> that's because there is no easy way. Everyone wants to find the easy way to finish, and it's, there, there just isn't. It's just freaking hard, which is why the best thing to do is to pick a thing and stick with it and really try to master that one type of finish. That's my two cents on finishing. And the next question is from the Pragmatic Luthier. And he writes, I want to politely challenge the statement you made that pine should not be used for instrument tops, specifically because I question your ability to substantiate that. Historically, lutes were made with Swiss pine tops over the last 30 years, I have made several tops from eastern white pine and have found it to be a first-class material. Pine tops can produce a shimmer and sustain that is remarkable. Even eastern hemlock can produce a guitar top equal to any of the accepted tone woods. Many of us remember very well when the use of such things as redwood, bear claw spruce, sunken, and buried logs or salvage material were undesirable if not unthinkable, yet today we celebrate the use of all of them. And that is due to creative thinking, open-minded approaches to our craft, and forgetting the manufacturing mentality and the Martin Gibson Taylor gestalt, gestalt? Is that how you say that word? G-E-S-T-A-L-T, -E gestalt. Um, I don't know what that word means either. <laughs> I'll have to look that up in the dictionary later. Um, from the context, I, I gather that it means uh, they're, you know, sort of noble stature, right? It's the, the pedestal that they're standing on. Okay, so to address uh, your question here, so I don't, I don't know exactly I, I talk a lot, I do a lot of Q&As, I do a lot of videos, and stuff like this comes up a lot. So I don't know exactly what I said or where I said it, but I, I think this just might be a, a misunderstanding. When I say, my recommendation is simply that beginners don't use something like pine. Uh, my recommendation is basically that beginners, beginners, like first time guitar makers, or maybe second or third time guitar makers, stick to woods that are easily sourced from supply houses, luthier supply houses, so that way you don't get caught up in resawing your own material and certainly in having to make sure your material is dry enough to start using, right? There's so much when you're starting out in guitar making, that there's so much uh, depth that you can get into at each stage of the build. So much so that it, it's helpful to simplify it for yourself and not get dragged down the rabbit hole of resawing your own material or, you know, because your neighbor has a, a pine tree in his backyard and going out there and cutting it up and using that material. If you order from LMI or something like that, I'm not, you know, 
trying to chill for LMI. I don't care who you order from, but if you order from a, a company that is reliable, you know what you're getting, you can get decent quality material. That's the bigger thing I'm concerned with, not the species. I really don't care about species. I'm not a, a Tonewood species guy within reason. I actually agree with him I, without having the specific experience of using these woods that he's talking about, the pine and the eastern hemlock and stuff like that. I agree with him that it's very likely that those woods are just as good as what the standards are today. But there isn't an industry really built around selling those to supply houses, right, for guitar makers. So anyway, unless he's talking about a different video, but I think that's what I was saying. Um, I just don't recommend it for beginners because there's a lot of chaos in wood. There's a lot of ways you can get yourself into trouble. And especially if you're relatively new to woodworking as well as guitar making, then you can really get yourself into trouble thinking that you have a good piece of wood and really, truly, you have a horrible piece of wood that's going to, uh, simply because of the, the, the way the grain is oriented or something like that, is going to warp and distort as soon as you start assembling your instrument. That, that's really all I mean by that, okay? I'm not a, a tone wood elitist by any stretch. And, and I do think the potential is there to build equally as good instruments from um, a lot of those materials. Obviously there are characteristic differences between woods, but it's more in how you use it than in what you use. Okay, you know what? I think that's a good, good, way, good place to end it off there. So uh, I look forward to answering your questions in the next round of DIY guitar making. And thank you for tuning in as you always do. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.